Good morning. Um, thanks, Boris. Uh, it's great to see the room's full again. It obviously, did, we did something right yesterday that you all came back for more. Um, so our first speaker today comes from, uh, from Italy, from Colors magazine. Now, Colors is a, uh, a very interesting case study in publishing. I think sometimes magazines have their time. They, they, they uh, achieve a great influence and a great importance, as Colors did maybe 20 years ago with... Uh, when it first launched with uh, Olivier Toscani and um, uh, Thibaut Kalman at the helm, they, they created a, a kind of new paradigm of, 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 of publishing with a, with a client supporting it, but it wasn't, it wasn't about the client, it was about themes and issues. Um, very allied to the, the, uh, the Benetton's uh, advertising campaigns of that era. But then subsequently, the, the magazine faded in, in, in importance, and it, it became less interesting. Um, still, very, still often hit, hit the mark and did some interesting things, but it, it appeared its day was over. Um, and yet now, we've, uh, the last few issues, the last few years, under the gu guidance of our next speaker, first as creative director and subsequently now as uh, uh, editor-in-chief, uh, Patrick Waterhouse has... Um, uh, reinvigorated the magazine and reinvented it, and it's now, I would argue, as important as it was in its heyday 20 years ago. So, a big welcome for Patrick Waterhouse. Hey, cheers. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about four things today. I'm going to show you a couple of projects which inform the direction that I took colors in. I'm going to give a very short history of the magazine. I'm going to take you through some of the issues that I've been making. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my approach. But first, here's a drawing of my life that I made. You can see where I was born in 1981 when I moved to London. When I left London and went to Fabrica, where colors is made. Um, I actually left Fabrica and was living in South Africa, and I returned in 2011 to start directing the magazine. But firstly, I'm going to show you a couple of projects that I was doing before Colors. And this one is about a building in Johannesburg called Ponty City. And myself and my collaborator, Mikhail Sabotsky, um, spent a long time in this building. It used to be the tallest residential building in the Southern Hemisphere. It was built in the heyday of apartheid. It was finished in 1976, which was the same year as the Soweto uprisings. And it was a whites-only building. And then after the end of apartheid, there was white flight from the city, and it became a symbol of the failed dream of post-apartheid South Africa, supposedly, and it was squatted. There's actually a fiction uh, written about by a German author called Ponty City. So we, we wanted to really see whether the mythology around the building was true. And it also involved a very kind of methodical form of documentation. And I had heard this quote from uh, Le Corbusier, who talks about understanding buildings through their apertures. So one of the things that we did is we took a picture out of every window in the building, going through from top to bottom. Um, and it took a few years to do, to actually kind of, we had to knock on every door of, of the building and explain to people the project. But it created this map of the space. We also did every uh, television and every door as well. There's, all, there's also a more formal, kind of traditional uh, documentary side to the pictures as well that we did, and a large use of archival material. Sorry, can you bring the lights down a little bit? So, thanks. Uh, um, and also rationalizing all of that material into a book form. And it's currently actually an exhibition in a place called Le Bal in France. Um, and it's also a book which is being published by Steidel at the moment. Um, another project as well, um, which was also a collaboration, um, I was asked by a German, public, uh, not German, sorry, Italian uh, publishing house, Mondadori, to do a version of Dante's Inferno. And I asked a friend to help me with it, and he wrote the notation. 
And he also read the book out loud to me. And as he read, I would sit and draw the characters within um, Dante's Inferno. And my idea was that it would be like a natural historian going with Darwin on the Beagle and actually imagining hell as a real place, the family trees behind the characters, and actually trying to document the flora and fauna and deconstruct. So there's a couple of projects in different ways, both in terms of social documentary and also kind of turning words into pictures that I think were important um, before doing Colours for me. I'm now going to give a very short history of the magazine. Colours began 22 years ago when the Italian photographer, um, Oliviero Toscani, asked a designer called Tibor Carmen to make a new kind of magazine. And it was based on a very simple but powerful premise that in this new globalized world that they saw around them, diversity was, was a good thing, and it was a celebration of global culture. A good example of this is issue number four, which is the race issue. Now, Colors used this very bold, didactic form of image making. It also was very provocative. This was almost before Photoshop was as ubiquitous as it is. I remember seeing this on the, the 6 o'clock news as a kid on television. It also took on the big issues of the day. This is issue number seven, which was the AIDS issue. And it used a very kind of provocative, direct form of, um, of sequencing of images. And I think it still holds up today as really it was great work. And it looked at large elemental themes like religion, wealth, touch, and multiculturalism. So in 2011, when I first got the opportunity to direct the magazine, I had this equation in my mind. The world is even more globalized and interconnected. So the central premise that the magazine is based on is more of a reality today, not less so. And the question I had was, is globalization just a good thing? Um, we're told that a website built in the Middle East is responsible for influencing people in London setting off a bomb. A mortgage that you get on your house in London is responsible for a bank in Greece defaulting on its debt. A car that you drive in Munich is responsible for the ice melting in the Arctic. We feel like the world is vastly complicated and beyond our ability to affect. So I didn't want to just make a magazine, I decided to make them in the form of guides, survival guides. And the first was a survival guide to transport. Sorry, can we have sound, please? Oh. Sorry. Is it here? OK. Um. So why transport? 90% of the way that we move is based on a finite resource. And I had been reading a lot about peak oil at the time, and this idea that this resource would run out. So I decided that we would look at people by virtue of their situation. They were being sustainable. They weren't part of academic institutions, but they were making their own forms of transport. And it begins with this quote from Henry Ford. Most people spend more time and energy going around problems than trying to solve them. How to build the next century. This is a plastic bottle. Now, 1,500 of these are thrown away every second in the United States alone. This one was found on a beach in Lamu in Kenya by Mansour. And he did something with it. He built a boat out of all of the debris and plastic bottles that he found on the beach. And he calls it the century. And he lives in the boat. And with this survival guide mode of storytelling, we show you how you can build your own. How to pick up arms against Gaddafi. This is an improvised control box. Now, each button on this control box fires two missiles. You'll find it in the front of a truck, a truck like this one. And farmers like Abdul would turn their pickup trucks uh, into tanks to fight against Gaddafi. And I'd seen these in the background of CNN reports. And I really wanted us to talk about an oil-producing nation. And I think it's a good example of using a particular way of image making, to a particular formal language, which is maybe a departure from the classic kind of reporting of current affairs. And of course, we show you how you can make your own. How to burn fat fast. 
These are chips from a deep fat fryer in the UK. Now, on average, a fish and chip shop in the UK produces about 20 liters of waste oil. And Buzz Fisher from Wales made a car which uses that oil, and he tours around the country campaigning. And we show you how you can use chip fat. You can even use human fat. There's a, a plastic surgeon in the States who used what he called lipodiesel out of his uh, patient's excess fat. You can use coffee. You can use hemp. You can even use shit. Shit is an incredible resource. You can get methane gas from shit. And it's also the next issue in the Survival Guide series. So why shit? More children die from diarrhea, a banal stomach bug, to anyone who has access to a flushable toilet, than die from HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. But we don't talk about it. You'll, you can get a celebrity to stand next to a tap, but you can't get them to stand next to a toilet. And there isn't really the language to engage with the issue, so it seemed important. This is a bed from Haiti after the cholera outbreak. And one of the symptoms of cholera is very chronic diarrhea. And I think it's another example of how an object or a vernacular piece of design can be very poignant. This is the F diagram, which shows how feces moves from fingers to food and how, when you don't have a flushable toilet, it's very easy for disease to carry. Emergency. This is a plastic garden chair. After the earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand, one like, this, one like this chair was used to make a toilet. And due to the fact that the sewage infrastructure had completely broken down, residents had a competition to build their own toilets. And of course, we show you how to build your own. So from shit to happiness. Happiness was the next issue in the Survival Guide series. And it was very challenging. Because unlike transport and shit, it's not a tangible topic. It's a state of mind. It's actually difficult to get to a definition. So the magazine looks at the new science of happiness from a neurological perspective and also a psychological perspective but more of a medical guide than the classic survival guide. And from the stories like this one, which is a church in Washington where people pray through laughter, we look at what's happening in the brain, what's happening and how endorphins are released through, through laughter, how to get more endorphins by eating certain food, how to choose your therapist. This is Morisco. He's a llama, but he's also a therapist. And he's used in a form of therapy called animal therapy. And it turns out that just touching an animal lowers the blood pressure in the animal and in the person touching it. And then we recommend other forms of animal therapy as well. So from happiness to the end of the world, um, the apocalypse was the next issue in the series. This is really the most survivally of the survival guide topics. And it was tying into the predicted end of the world with the Mayan calendar. This is a reinterpretation of the Mayan calendar where each quadrant relates to a different form of uh, climate change. So it was kind of using this opportunity to talk about what the world could look like according to climatological research. And we went to places in the world which are undergoing uh, now the predictions of the future from climate scientists. And this is in Montserrat, where there were large tectonic shifts and a volcano eruption. And we talk to people who have survived and live in the ashes of that event and teach you how you can negotiate your way through it. We also look at other things like desertification in China, how to breathe, what to grow in arid land, how to cook, and also talk to experts like this guy, Doug Hoffman, who teaches us how to hide. Now, there was an evolution here for me in terms of doing uh, the magazine, because the next issue looked at markets. In fact, the next three issues look at kind of 
Institutions that seem very close to our lives in some way, but actually we maybe don't understand them as well as we think. And it's based on this idea of markets being a network of trade. Um, and it works in a narrative structure. And it begins with this image. And according to historians, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, free markets were uncontested. And this is a satellite image. And this satellite technology was developed to spy on the Soviets during the Cold War. Now, those same satellites are used by stock market traders to analyze crop yields so they can predict the stock market price. And from there, we go to the Mercantile Stock Exchange, where there used to be 10,000 people working in the Mercantile Stock Exchange. Now only 1,000 remain, because com computer algorithms carry out 70% of trade. And from this new stock exchange office, we go to one of the computers. And I wanted to show this abstract rendering of reality that actually relates to real events. And I think that's something that I often failed to see when I look at, actually, the stock exchange. So this is a graph that shows what happened to the stock market after the death of Osama bin Laden, um, what happens when a politician resigns, and the weather. And from this computer, we found where one like this would end up. And we found this one just outside Alaba Market in Nigeria. And each market we go to is an excuse to talk about an economic principle. So this looks at planned obsolescence and how things are made to break. But computers like this have a second economic cycle, because people like Julius take them, and they recycle them, and they get sold at Alaba Market. And the magazine carries on in this causal way. So from markets to news. This also looks at another seemingly familiar institution, which is the media, and looks at due to the advent of new technologies and inherent human bias, how the news can distort. And it begins with this randomly selected page of the Daily Mail newspaper, where all articles that derive from press releases and wire copy have been removed. Now, this has always been part of how newsmaking happens, but it's just exponentially happening. And it has these internal pages that which try and look kind of behind the scenes of the, the news. And it looks at how, due to a changing economic model, the amount of people working in newspapers has been massively reduced. You have less people expected to do more in the same amount of time, so that's bound to affect the way in which reporting happens. And this series of pictures are all taken at the Philadelphia Inquirer, which are our case study. And the Philadelphia Inquirer used to have uh, foreign bureaus across the world. Now they have none. And from there, we look at people who are plugging that gap. These are pictures taken by Noor Biram, who lives in Wazaristan in Pakistan. Now, no journalists are allowed there. And he was a fixer. And he's one of the few people documenting what happens after a drone strike. And he simply hears it on the radio. And he goes there, and he takes documentation. And again, you open up the internal page within the magazine, and you find this thing that Noor found in the debris. And usually, the bodies are blown to pieces. So it's impossible to identify who's been killed in a drone strike. So they have to find ID cards to verify the deaths. And then also, within the magazine, we have these comics, which are like process diagrams that take you through a day of his working process. Then this is another way people are trying to report the unreportable. It's an application that you can download on your phone called Dronestagram. Um, and it takes the GPS coordinates of where a drone strike has happened and then sends it to you. Drones are also used by paparazzi. This one was used to take pictures of Paris Hilton on the French Riviera. And this is a picture of a picture which is interesting because it's no longer about the decisive moment. This is the, was the picture that spread around the world of Gaddafi. And it was actually taken off the back of a rebel's camera. So it's the picture of the picture becoming the, the image which gets spread around the world. So from news to art, art in our kind of secularized world. The art world, is, and particularly museums and galleries, have become like churches. And although we go to more galleries than ever, we wanted to look at whether we really understand what art is anymore. And we asked a very simple question, which is, what is art? 
What is art? Hey, this one is very difficult for, for Einstein. Arte è tutto, è l'infinito. What is art? Futuring. Art is what makes you feel good. Wat is kunst? Ja, is goed. Um, dan moet, mag ik er even over nadenken of moet ik gelijk antwoorden? What is art? Oh. <laughs> it's what they give us. I've been teaching art for 40 something years and the question has been asked to me. Um, it's very hard to put an answer to it. C'est compliqué. Che cos'è l'arte? Emozione. Ah. Uh, I don't know. Madonna, quanto tempo ho per rispondere? Art is uh, business. Sex and fashion. Uh, it's something I do. I need to do. When I'm here, talking to you, I miss it. Art is Finnish. It's free when it's good, when it uh, costs a lot of money, most likely not good anymore. Art is a representation of how a person views the world. Qu'est-ce que c'est l'art? Nothing in particular. L'arte è tutto. L'arte è tutto. Hey. Ben, L'art, c'est ce qui... C'est ce qui montre ce qu'on ne peut pas voir. Parfois. Art is something that is... useless, but it helps sensible beings to have a better life, probably. It's wonderful, the only thing living for, worth living for. Okay? <laughs> so we made that um, video in the epicenter of the art world during the Venice Biennale. And the cover of the magazine you, is an empty gallery, and you choose what you deem fit to go in the gallery. And this is a neon sign. It was actually a doodle on my desk that we got a local neon sign maker to make. And it has no monetary value. It's never been shown in a gallery. It is not a work of art. This is a work of art. It has a monetary value of over 100,000 pounds, I think. And it's made by the artist Tracy Emin. And it's asking this very simple question of why, and looking at this moment of transformation, how something becomes a work of art. And it also looks at people who are behind the art world, like Mr. Cevietti, who is the maker in the age of the idea, there's an invisible force of people who actually make the work and do the craft. And he's made works for G Jeff Koons, Mark Quinn. He also has done a few commissions for Saddam Hussein. This was a bust that he did for Saddam Hussein. And this is Vic Hislop, who caught the shark for Damien Hirst. He actually also uh, put sharks in formaldehyde before Damien Hirst as well. Um, and from there, we look at conservation within the art world, particularly in relation to contemporary art. And again, how this moment of transformation works. This is the Jeff Koons, which was dropped. It's now worth nothing. Ai Weiwei has dropped a pot, and its monetary value has gone up. So again, looking at that kind of intentionality in art. So from art to protest. This is the current issue of the magazine. And... Uh, I had heard and been listening to um, Slavo Zizek talk about how we look at the protests as being kind of national events, but actually they should be seen differently. They should be seen as one singular protest in a way. And actually, often nations that are protesting within their nation states are often protesting about external forces which are beyond their control to affect. And that seemed like an interesting insight. So. The section try, well, each section tries to contextualize why a protest um, has taken pa place through external forces instead of just showing protests. So it begins in Russia in 2010 when Russia su um, suffered its worst drought in a century. Russian wheat farmers stopped exporting their crops. Within six months, global wheat prices had doubled. Egyptians eat more bread per person than any other people in the world. 
more than half the people in the Arab world are under 30. And then it goes to a 26-year-old street vendor who set himself on fire after he was, um, had his uh, scales confiscated. And when Bouzizi did this, this is the moment that the media grabbed onto and became the folklore of the catalyst for uh, the Arab Spring. But it was interesting to try and go to the conditions that were before that, that led to that moment. And it spread news of that, and other people started self-emulating in the Arab world. And there was a call to take for people to gather in Tahrir Square, and then you go from this to this. And then it looks at movements within um, the Arab Spring, like the revolutionary group, the April 6th movement, who used a fist as a symbol. And they got that fist, that logo, from another group, which were a Serbian group called Okpor, who got their symbols and strategies from a book by an American academic called Gene Sharp who wrote a book which is very important within protest movements. You can actually be arrested and go to jail in many countries just for owning a PDF of this book. And we give a small insert of the book, which is very practical adv ad advice on how to use nonviolent resistance. And then it also looks at a series of strategies. This is a banknote from Iran. Now, after the protests, when an Iranian uh, protester was killed, YouTube was blocked. So to bypass the mainstream media, people started putting pictures on the banknotes to disseminate the information. And then we have these inserts which show how money can be used as a means of protest. We also look at effigies. This was a pig that we got the Occupy Kenya movement to make for us. And the Kenyan prime minister earns more than Angela Merkel and Barack Obama combined. There's a huge amount. They're the highest paid politicians in the world in Kenya. And um, so the Kenyan Occupy movement made this pig effigy to protest against government greed. And they also released live pigs outside the parliament and wrote the names of all the different politicians on them outside. Um, and from there, we look at crowd control as well and how people deal with large groups of people. Um, and we went to Israel as well and looked at anti-riot tanks. And then went to Berlin, where they paint themselves as avatars and the appropriation of symbols in order to... Um, uh, actually kind of use them to leverage uh, something that um, is, means something and resonates with people. And then we look at other strategies that are used within Berlin. So there's a very quick overview of some of the recent issues. Now I'm just going to talk very quickly about the approach. Visualizing the issue. It's not enough just to have an interesting story. There has to be a visual component to it. It has to tell the story through pictures. We use a formal language. We objectify. We use the typological method so we can see the similarities between things and the differences. I call this thingness, which is how, like, how something can be more poignant a simple piece of design than the classic reportage image. This is a banknote. After Mobutu was overthrown in the Congo, they couldn't afford to reprint the currency, so they simply hole-punched his face out of the money and kept on using it. We deconstruct things down to their component parts, show how things work, literally say how something moves around the body. We show process. These are tunnels which go from Egypt into Gaza. And of course, as we're a guide, we explain how to. And another thing I think which is a current which goes through the work is a celebration of human ingenuity. And there's also an important element of building around the printed magazine. The, the magazine is at the core and is the distillation of all the work, but also translating that into exhibitions. This is at the Design Museum. From this image, we got the programmers at Fabrica to reverse engineer a news machine which takes tweets and sends them through a uh, distortion process. And there's really two stories at the moment within printed media. There's the end of you know, the daily newspaper in a way and, and ephemeral news. But when you make something which is very in-depth and kind of uh, 
a large amount of research. It deserves to be a physical object. And actually, this kind of tension between technologies pushes the form and actually makes you interrogate why you're doing things and actually create print which utilizes the medium and actually is a real strength. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for this great start, colorful start of the day.